So I've been off farm this week and I had to travel. I went out to Tennessee and it was for something related to the farm, but not exactly. I was going out to Tennessee to meet with a sponsor. So because I make videos and put them on the internet, there are companies out there that pay me money to talk about their products. And so yes, I lined up a farm sitter, I hopped on a plane, and I was out in Tennessee. And it's always hard for me when I do stuff like this because sometimes I start to get imposter syndrome. And I start to wonder, like, what sort of farmer am I actually? Like, what sort of farmer would leave their farm in the summer to go meet with some company and talk about their products? But the reality is, yes, I'm a farmer, and yes, I have a farm. But the truth of it is, I'm also a social media influencer and a content creator. You know, when you're traveling, you often have a lot of time to be reflective and think. And oftentimes when I'm traveling, I also have a chance to read. And I was reading a book that very much sort of connected me and highlighted for me the dilemma I often feel when it comes to that sense of imposter syndrome. And specifically, it's a book about essentially the history of social media influencers and content creation and, and really putting your life online. And as I've made that choice to put my farm online and live my life online and make that a part of how I earn my living as well as how I grow my farm, it's one of those decisions that has strengths and weaknesses. But as I sat there, particularly on the airplane, reading this book, it got me thinking a lot about those trade-offs. And so I decided I wanted to actually talk to the woman who wrote this book extremely online. Because this book is like the history of social media influencers and content creators really starting back with the, the rise of the blogs and the blog era of the 2000s, shifting towards the social media platforms and the Instagramification of life in the teens, and ultimately resting on the weird place that we find ourselves today. And so that is going to be the focus of today's podcast. How to be, become a social media influencer, or as my dad calls it, not have a real job. 80% of social media cannot spell social or media. Have you seen her Insta? She's an influencer. Who knew that social media was gonna work? I work in social media, so it's my job to be on Tumblr. Wow, who doesn't have social media nowadays? Who you are on social media is an extension of who you are in real life. It's social media. And now I just sit in an office and scroll through Instagram and social media and try to find pictures of people doing... <laughs> Joining me now is Taylor Lorenz. Taylor is a reporter over at the Washington Post, and she has just written this new book that, again, I'm like obsessed with and I haven't stopped thinking about since I read it. Taylor, thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. So, Taylor, to kind of get into it and just give a little background for folks who have not been reading the book constantly like I have over the last week, what, in your words, would you say the book's focused on and, and what were you trying to do when you decided to write it? Yeah, the book is about, as you mentioned, the first kind of 20 to 25 years of the social internet. So, you know, obviously the internet's been around for longer than a couple decades, but it's really only the past two decades that we've really had this like social internet where we can connect with each other and build audiences on the internet in meaningful ways. So um, it charts the rise of social media from sort of MySpace stars to Tumblr to the blogging revolution, Twitter, Vine, Snapchat, live streaming boom of the, you know, 2010s. Um, it's just sort of like a zoomed out view of the rise of social media. I think a lot, there's been so many books that are like the Facebook book or the, you know, like these sort of like platform specific books that tell the, the story of social media through the story of one platform. But um, yeah, I want to zoom out and look at this whole industry and look and cover it from the content creator side. Cause so much is written about these businesses, but I feel like people don't really talk about, you know, what it's really like being a content creator and how it all came to be. Definitely. And, and I actually hadn't really traced some of those lines that you brought up in the book. Like, for example, you start by talking about uh, political bloggers and really sort of the role that political bloggers around like the Bush Gore election actually played a role in cracking stories and, you know, the downfall of Trent Lott as being kind of these like watershed moments. But then as I look at where it is today, the online commentary and influence in this world is like at the core, if not the center of like 
how we communicate and how we synthesize any event or activity that's going on now. You're a hundred percent right. I think it's like, I mean, I wanted to kind of trace the earliest emergences of this sort of shift. And so you started to see, especially in the early 20, 20 early aughts, um, you really started to see like these little moments of obsessive power, like little kind of like you mentioned the political bloggers and the Trent Law thing. And then in entertainment, you had, of course, Perez Hilton emerging and kind of forcing tabloids to rethink their coverage strategies and tone. And um, you have this in every industry. I, I write about Bloggergate, which was when Dolce and Gabbana seated fashion bloggers in the front row of their um, fashion show in New York, uh, which at the time was like a huge scandal. And people couldn't believe that, you know, people from the internet were like sitting front row with these real magazine editors. And so you just started to see these kind of like this power shift happening um, between sort of content creators on the internet and institutional actors. And now that power shift, I think, is actually an interesting one because it, it, in a lot of ways, it seems like it's been a very good thing where you had these gatekeepers very much controlling what could be talked about, what couldn't be talked about, how people perceive various things, whether it be fashion or parenting advice or, I don't know, farming even. But as you look now where we're at 2023, was it a good thing? <laughs> I think it's up for debate. I mean, it's been incredibly liberatory for so many people. It's it's really provided so much opportunity. I mean, you're mentioning like farming, you know, I, I think people are really able to monetize, um, you know, their passions and make money on things that they love to do. Um, a friend of mine is extremely into bikes and um, has a, you know, creates tons of content about bikes and has been able to get like, you know, to try some of the best bikes out there, I guess, like mountain bikes are a whole thing. So, you know, it's like this, it's this great opportunity in so many ways, but then there are so many downsides as well as we're all kind of aware of. It's like, you have to co also commodify things you love to do, which is can sort of take away from the fun of it sometimes, or, you know, it's, it's just a sort of like extra burden of work that you have to do. It's very unstable. Um, you know, just in the sense that you're relying on these platforms and algorithms that can change and evolve and you don't have control over them. Um, and, you know, obviously it's also just sort of disrupted our information ecosystem. So there's tons of, you know, people now get their news and information from content creators, which um, again, can be a good thing. Sometimes they're outside the norms of mainstream and can sort of give a more accurate take of what's going on. But sometimes of course they also spread misinformation. As somebody who has earned their living primarily by being a content creator over the last, you know, almost two years. And even before that was earning like a significant chunk of income from that for the last, I don't know, five, five and a half years. I think the biggest thing I've struggled with is the authenticity of it all. Like how much are you doing to do and document to put your life online versus how much are you doing? Because that's, what's going to drive the attention online, which is going to ultimately be the thing that pays you. Is, is that a phenomena that has been there from the start or has that been growing? That tension, it, it has always been a little bit It's in there since the start, just in the sense that like when you present a version of your life online, like you're inherently going to leave some stuff out or maybe just sort of tailor it to a specific audience and what you think would be interested in. But I think these algorithmic feeds have made it much more intense and also just the number of content creators out there, like the shifts in content, for instance, like... I think things were a lot more curated when we had a photo driven internet, like early Instagram days versus today when it's all about TikTok and YouTube and kind of like these more Instagram stories, right? These more like sort of ephemeral, real short form um, platforms that incentivize different, like less polished content, I guess. Um, but I talk about actually in the end of the book that like desire to capture and um, storytell around, you know, like your specific experiences and just how even if you're quote unquote authentic, you're still performing authenticity, right? Like we're all sort of performing for each other all day online. I, I, I think that that's a, a really good point because I mean, just like really for people who are listening to this podcast right now to pull the veil back, this like these questions I'm asking Taylor, right? These have been things I've been thinking about. I even texted her saying, hey, I'm going to try to talk about this. And now here we are talking about it. And so, you know, while this is a very real conversation and we're we're bouncing off into each other going back and forth. It's not like there wasn't premeditated thought that goes into it, right? Yeah, exactly. Like, I mean, it's – which is, by the way, like how it always is, you know? Like people, I think, worry a lot about authenticity online or they're like, oh, you know, this person's not authentic. But the truth is we are different versions of ourselves and we present different versions of ourselves to the world um, 
always, right? Like who you are with your friends is different than who you are at work and it's different than who you are in maybe social situations. So I think we've always kind of had these multiple identities and the internet has forced us to kind of scale like some of those where it's like, okay, well now you're presenting to millions. So who are you going to be in front of millions of people, you know, and how are you going to tailor yourself um, and evolve too? You know, some people start sharing a lot and change their mind and clam up. Some people don't share as much and then they end up opening up over time. So it really kind of, it can evolve too. I, I think that's a good point. And, and like, if I think back to like that choice I made to say, Hey, I'm going to start documenting what it's like to raise ducks when you've never raised ducks before. So that when I have to sell duck eggs, people might be like knowing who my farm is. And then like, there's an audience there. Like that was my original choice. But if I look over the last five plus years of what's happened like it wasn't like one conscious choice of, Hey, here's what I'm comfortable sharing versus not like, for example, earlier this year, I made a video talking about like the fact that I've struggled with like a binge eating disorder. And like, that was never something I would have even remotely considered doing. But as you go and as you put your life out there, you become more comfortable with some things. And then there's other things where I talk about even less now than I did say four or five years ago. Yeah, your relationship with the internet kind of evolves and changes. And also I think it has to do with your audience too and kind of like the trust you have in your audience or what your audience is interested in and what you kind of feel like they can relate to. You know, sometimes you post something and you get a lot of feedback and it actually really resonates with people and you're like, hmm, I never would have thought that, you know, and so you might lean into it a little bit more. And um, and it's important to kind of evolve, right? You don't just want to like, you learn so much as you go. As, with every video you post, you're kind of learning something. So you don't just want to keep posting as if, you know, you just got online. I, I think that evolution point is something else that really popped out for me as I was reading your book, where, you know, you look at how content creation kept evolving as the technology kept evolving and the platforms kept evolving. So, you know, back in 2003, you know, you didn't have mobile internet, really. You didn't have like video as an easily accessible thing. It took hours to download a video file still. And, and so that's where blogs came into play, but now it's, you know, everything's mobile video and it's just about watching short videos on your phone. It seems like over the last 20 years, like each new technology changed the form of expression. Is that an accurate statement? That's a completely accurate statement. I think that, um, you know, these social technologies have such an interesting relationship with their users and it's this real push and pull. Um, I think they, you know, Silicon Valley, whatever, tech people kind of create these tools, but they often don't know how the tools will be used um, or how the product will evolve because so much of social platforms success or failure is actually the user base, right? And like what the, how the user base ends up adopting them or how they use specific features and what the norms become. I mean, I bring up TikTok a lot. TikTok's core features haven't changed that much since 2020. They've evolved a little bit, but um, you know, how people posted in 2018 and 2019 on TikTok is so different than now, just the norms and the formats. And so all of these things evolve and I think shape the way we express ourselves. One thing though, it does seem like if I look at the innovations of the last, I don't know, year or two when it comes to social media platforms, it doesn't seem like there's anything new. It seems like everybody's like trying to copy everybody else where, you know, you've got shorts and reels, which are effectively TikToks and, and like everybody's now kind of like trying to like make you shop on their platform. Like, like all these like macro trends seem to be going in the same direction versus something divergent. It, should that be concerning? The way it, it, it's been in the past few years, especially with the rise of TikTok is like, TikTok does something, they have success with it, and so then every other social platform copies it. And I think that's because we have a lack of innovation in the social space. I mean, I would love to see more kind of like interesting one-off types of apps or, you know, just like apps that could truly compete with these other platforms. But we have such a monopoly. Google and Facebook have such a monopoly on um, the attention economy in this country. And, you know, I think it's telling that the only app that could meaningfully challenge Google and Facebook was TikTok, which is owned by a multi-billion dollar Chinese tech conglomerate. Like that's the level of resources. You know, TikTok spent a billion dollars in marketing in 2019 alone. And that is just an obscene amount of money that no startup could actually, you know, often have. So I think it's just, yeah, it's just interesting how sort of competitive they've been with TikTok because I think it's the real, it's the first real app that's given them a, a real run for their money. So now you just used a phrase, the attention economy. Can you like unpack that one and explain that a little bit more? Because I, I think it's an interesting concept. 
Yeah. Um, I mean, I think that what the attention economy speaks to is kind of this online marketplace of attention. I talk about this a little bit in the book, but I do think that sort of online attention is its own form of currency. Like as the internet has evolved and, you know, we've lived in this sort of social world and I would say the internet is almost like the default reality that we all sort of live in today because it's your things that happen online, like scale to a level that they could never IRL, like your experience IRL is like so limited versus the internet, which is permanent and vast. Um, and so, yeah, I think that like online attention itself is a form of a, a new form of currency in our world. And so if you amass enough online attention, you can do anything, right? You can use that to launch a business. You can launch a political career. You can, um, you know, kind of build a product and then sell it to this audience. But it's like that attention itself is powerful. And so sometimes people are up, sometimes people are lose their attention, right? Like it's just, it's kind of its own marketplace um, every day on the internet. Mm -hmm. Does that promote bad behavior? <laughs> yes, it definitely does. <laughs> I think, um, I mean, I talk about this in, in my book, especially related to the prank era of YouTube, which was really 2017, 2018, when there was a lot of pressure for content creators to be doing daily vlogs. I don't know if you remember that kind of era of the daily vlog era, but which is insane. Like, I mean, now I feel like just thinking of producing a vlog every day, it's so much work. Um, so, you know, there's um, there's a lot of stuff that, that people will take sort of like cheap shortcuts, which is to do these like outrageous pranks, um, promote really bad things. Ultimately, it's all about getting views. And if you live in this world that rewards views and attention over everything else, it will incentivize a lot of bad behavior because people will do anything for attention. But what other options are there? Virtually every social media platform right now, their primary driver of revenue is coming from advertising. And so you're delivering on eyeballs. If it's that based on eyeballs, is there any other behavior that they would try to promote beyond just attention? Well, attention is one thing, but it's like, that can't be the only thing you're optimizing for. I mean, it's a huge consequences of this ad driven model. There are absolutely other business models these companies could pursue, um, but they don't want to because this has been incredibly profitable for them. So they're not gonna sort of meaningfully change those incentive structures. Um, I would also say that like, there are things they could do to tamp down and, and sort of lower the pressure on content creators, especially in 2018. I read about this in my book in 2019 when a lot of high profile YouTubers started burning out. Like, you know, YouTube did change things. Actually, a study just came out yesterday. I think it was just maybe a couple of days ago, but it was about Facebook's rabbit hole problem and how, you know, they used to, they, they really had this issue where they were sending people down these extremist paths. You would watch one video, it would put you down. And actually this new study found that YouTube made a lot of meaningful changes in their algorithm and now is not sending as many people down those paths. And that's a huge change and a huge positive change, I would say. Actually, it's really kudos to YouTube to finally dealing with it. I mean, they only deal, dealt with it after their feet were held to the fire by like Congress and the media for years. But um, but I think it's examples of how these platforms can actually incentivize more healthy behavior. It's just that ultimately does cut into their revenue and they don't want to do that. Mm. It, and, and I guess if I'm looking at it from the content creator angle, right, because, you know, there's the, the platform level revenue motives, but then, you know, for somebody like me, it's, it's something I've struggled with over and over again, where I realize that like every time I have a conflict with say like a hunter who wants to come on my land to hunt a bear, like that's going to be the video that's going to get, you know, millions of views versus like me walking around the farm and talking about different species of tree that we have, like Eh, it's just it's it's a harder sell and so you know back to my point that i was making earlier around my struggle with authenticity it's really hard to find like the right balance between those two things i feel like all content creators kind of have to like balance you know what is sort of like the clicky compelling stuff versus the sort of more, more mundane stuff i will say that like I mean, it's it's helpful to have that balance. Like if you only had conflict on your channel, that can provide a lot of short-term attention and growth, but it's really hard to sustain long-term. And people actually get kind of burned out because you have to keep upping the ante every time. So it's really not in the content creator's best interest to do that long-term if you wanna build this like sustainable business. If you're just trying to get short attention really quick, sure. So I think like it's about sort of, yeah, like finding the right balance that works for you and, um, and being true to yourself and figuring out kind of like, who's the audience that I want to cultivate on this channel? Do I want to cultivate an audience of people that are only here to see like drama or is it more about, you know, following the spectrum of life on this farm and, 
you know, what, what the, the good and the bad, the boring and the fascinating. I, I think the rewarding part about making videos oftentimes is that it's like a creative outlet. And I love the fact that on one end I can be like doing physical work and like, like seeing the difference in, in actually working on the farm. And on the other end, I can document it and tell a story and it like, you know, scratches that creative itch. And so I see that as a positive, but do you feel like social media platforms in this day and age are the place to create art? Yeah, I mean, I certainly do. I, I, I mean, I think the internet is a, a phenomenal place to create art. Um, I think what's a little bit hard is that sometimes social media platforms can sort of push us into these really contrived formats, and it can be a little bit hard to break the format, you know, especially if something's performing well, and then you maybe experiment a little bit, right, and get a little creative and it doesn't perform as well. It's like that feedback on your art that can kind of mess with your head. But I think there's so many incredible creative tools, especially on platforms like TikTok that like have really unlocked this new forms of creativity among people. And I, I think it's a great place for people to experiment. You know, not everyone has the technological skills or know-how or really wants to kind of like build their own website, you know, where they upload things. And um, so I think like social media is a great place to reach people. It's a great place to express yourself, but you just have to kind of make sure that those that those incentives aren't like shaping the creative work that you do too much. Mm. I, I, I think that that is a, a part of the struggle where it's like, what voices do you listen to? What voices do you not listen to? both on the good side and the bad, like, you know, who, che who cheers you on, who like harasses you and gives you crap for what you're doing. Like, I don't know. It's been a dilemma that I, I don't feel like I, I've, I've been able to truly balance in the right way, even at this stage of the game. Yeah. It's so hard. I would say too, just like the level of feedback, like some people have extremely strong opinions. Um, I'm sure you've encountered this before and like, you know, other people's content, or maybe you stop a content series and they get really angry about it. Like they feel very entitled to some content sometimes, and it can just really end up affecting you. Um, and so I think anybody that wants to go into this world, it's like you, you really have to have a kind of a strong sense of yourself and like what you want to do and don't just let yourself, you know, be like, don't let what you're making just be completely dictated by like random people that might not even be your core fans. Yeah, no, I, I think that makes sense. I know for a fact that I farm differently now because I put my content out there versus if I didn't. Do you find like as a reporter in this day and age that you have to report differently than you would because of, you know, things that are happening on, on Twit X um, or like threads or somewhere else like like do, does you find that oh, that yeah. real-time feedback changes how you work oh a hundred percent it's so funny I mean it's more it's not even that I'm documenting I don't very much document my experience of reporting cause it's mostly just me on the phone calling people um, but it's you know I cover big content creators and those big content creators absolutely use me for content um, themselves you know they're especially if I'm doing a negative story um, I'll give an example is like this one political content creator um, online actually I was doing a story on them um, last year and I went um, you know to see comment this this content creator had hung up with me on the phone and especially if we're doing a big story it's so important to make sure that you've given the person the right chance to respond so I started to think you know yeah that person hung up on me but I'm not sure that that was them. Like, it, you know, you just never know. And the last thing I want to do is run an article and have the person say, well, you didn't talk to me. So um, I did what's called door knocking, which is what we always do in journalism, which is you show up at someone's door and you knock on the door and you say, hey, do you have any comment? This is like 101, right? Like this, this is the most basic thing reporters do is like knock on doors, ask for comment. If someone says no comment, you just say thank you and you walk away. Um, but of course, this content creator immediately takes a picture of me at the door and says, you know, this person is at my house, you know, trying to X, Y, Z. Of course, it was so ridiculous. All I did is like knock on the door and walk away. But um, it was a good example of kind of like how they used me for content and kind of I've had that same thing. I've, I called a Twitch streamer one time and I found out that he was live streaming my interview with him actually on his uh, Twitch stream. And so, you know, sometimes people are doing it for nefarious purposes. Sometimes actually at the Twitch streamer, I talked to him later and he was like, oh, well, I just thought it would be cool and interesting. And I don't get calls from reporters much. And I was like, oh, yeah. It's totally fine, but I didn't know that I was, you know, I probably would have sounded more coherent if I knew I was, good, you know, on a Twitch stream. So, so anyway, content is all around us. We're all kind of using these opportunities in our lives for content. And um, as a reporter, I think when I'm reaching out to people, I, I am often used for content and I don't mind generally, but it can be a lot. 
Well, I mean, I mean, it's an interesting premise, right? Because it's like, where do you draw that line? And I feel like the line that you might draw could be different than what I draw versus what that Twitch streamer draws. And like, as you start to look at that uneven kind of social norm, it does make it a sort of weird place to live in this day and age. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I think it's also very funny when like, you know, again, it's it's when I interview people IRL from the internet, it always kind of, there's always this weird dynamic. I think a lot of people like live on the internet, create content on the internet, and it almost doesn't seem real. And I was at VidCon, which is this online video conference thing a couple months ago, and I was interviewing some people IRL, and they were just like, oh, this is so different interacting with a reporter, you know, in person. And it felt weird for them to record. Like they would record on the internet if it was a sort of online interview, but like, in person, it, there was that like social awkwardness to it, I guess. And um, it's just well, it, it, it's funny you bring up VidCon because I, I actually I had this on my list of things I wanted to talk about. So, you know, I went out to VidCon for the first time ever this past year. And, you know, between kind of the pandemic and everybody being really, you know, not wanting to travel and get in large gatherings and that not being a good kind of option, it feels like as things have kind of slowly moved back to sort of a more normal state of operation, I was like, all right, let me finally try to go. And I got to say, like, I was so overwhelmed by that experience where, like, I can put stuff out and have thousands of people see it in an hour or two. And like, OK, that doesn't phase me. But then, like, to have, like, 20 people come up to me and say, hey, and like chat, it was like exhausting. And and, and I, I just was struck by just how different things now feel. And I couldn't tell, is this just like post pandemic, just getting back to like being around people or is this something different? I think it's actually something that's just inherent to internet creation. Like, I think there's this, there's always this like weird kind of like awkwardness almost, like, especially in the beginning of like when you first encounter those people IRL. Like, I mean, I write about this in my book, but even bloggers, like, there was this the conference called Blog Her <laughs> for women bloggers. And I, I talked to a lot of women bloggers, at, you know, in the late aughts that were just like, oh, you know, I don't mind, my blog reaches millions, but I have five people come up to me and it's very stressful and I don't know how to interact with them. And I get very, you know, and I think it's just a totally different skill set that actually a lot of us, maybe because of the pandemic and just because we're living more and more of our lives online, like we're not used to those sorts of social interactions. And it's fame, it's, it's weird. Most people don't experience fame. Like in the past, there was this like stratified version where like, okay, if you're a celebrity, people would approach you, but if you're not a real like A-lister, like no one's gonna know who you are. Now we all have this like, sort of in-between fame almost, which is just hard to manage. It, it, it is like, I mean, like, yeah, where you go into some like, hey, is somebody looking at me weird because they recognize me or are they looking at me weird just because I did something weird and I, I need to, you know, be more conscious of something? It, it's it's definitely a struggle in this day and age. A hundred percent. Yeah. It's so funny. And it would you would think that that seems like, I mean, I've had that myself. Like, I'm like, do they know me from the Internet? And then it's like. May, probably not, but maybe sometimes they do. You just never know. Well, I, I actually did that to you. Do you remember this? <laughs> so, so, so you and I first met at VidCon this past summer. Oh, and wait. I was actually, yes. I, I, I was having like this meltdown, like sitting by the fountain, like being like, uh. yes. And then I actually looked up and I was like, hey, wait a minute. Isn't that Taylor Lorenz? <laughs> and yeah. And it was like, uh, <laughs> I walked up and said, hi. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my God. That's right. I know that VidCon was such a blur this year. It was so crazy. Um, yeah, it was, I, that fountain was like giving me solace. Cause I had to, I was just like, I need to sit down. <laughs> well, no, I mean, it's, it's so true. Cause I, that was exactly what I was doing. I was just like, Oh, let me just get away from the world. Let me just relax. Kind of reset. Yeah. Like, and it was, yeah. So yeah, it, it is odd when those sort of online barriers that you have up where you can be comfortable being extremely online and then it's like extremely in person just feels so much more uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. It's awkward, especially like since COVID. Cause I mean, I haven't been to VidCon since I guess the last VidCon was 2019. They had the virtual one, but it was a lot, you know, so much has changed too. Like everything's bigger. Yeah, no, most definitely. So, so where do you see things going next? Like as like privacy pops up as a bigger and bigger issue, you've got AI and just, you know, is this even that person now becoming more and more of an issue as I like just finished editing a video where I've got Hank Hill singing low by Flo Rida in a video like Do I look 
act like I know what a JPEG is. I just want a picture of a god dang hot dog. That's like now stuff I can just do from my farm. Like, like where are things going? Like what's going to happen next? Yeah, I think things are about to get even crazier. Um, I do think privacy is a huge concern. Like I think this era of the 2010s that was defined by these big broadcast based social platforms where like everything you post is public to the entire world by default it's permanent and it's you know like it's it's gonna like live forever like that i don't think anybody i don't think people want that like i think it was very novel in the first half of the 2010s to post publicly to everyone in the world um and now i think actually most people don't want to do that like people prefer close friends people prefer group chats like there's this like notion of like hey maybe my instagram account shouldn't just be default public to everyone or default private like there should be these like weird not weird but like there should be these more like niche forms of sharing where you can kind of segment your audience for content a little bit um just because we know the downsides of reaching everyone and same thing with like twitter and everything it's like these permanent feeds that follow us and you have to manually archive things if you want to take them down i just think that era of social media is going away um that doesn't mean that there won't be big platforms but it's more about kind of reaching the right people and tiktok is a little bit it leaning in this way in the sense that like you don't need followers on tiktok really to reach your audience like tiktok sort of segments you and it will sort of deliver your content to people that it thinks will find it interesting kind of inherently um so i think there's always you know people will still be build building audiences online i don't think the creator industry is going anywhere um but i also think it'll be transformed by ai which ai creative tools are already doing so much and it's forcing all creators to up the quality of their content which is also exhausting so um that's going to be interesting to see too. Well, I, I, it is. And, and, and like, I look at it, it's like almost, there's like some good to it and some bad to it. Right. Where on the good, I'm able to, as just like one dude living in Vermont, able to like make images that would have taken, you know, three graphic artists to create over the span of a couple of weeks for thousands of dollars. I can like bang it out in 15 minutes in mid journey. Or like even this podcast, I will probably use a platform like Descript to do an edit that probably would have taken me two hours to do in like a traditional editing software and I'll probably like crank it out in like 15 minutes. And like that scalability is great. But then I always wonder like what's going to happen with quality and like what's going to happen to like what's real and what's not real when anything can be manifested at sort of the drop of a hat by pretty much anyone. That I think is going to be sort of the defining problem of this next decade uh, that I guess we're already three years into, but like um, just this sort of lack of understanding of, of what people can believe um, and what they can trust. We already have basically zero media literacy in this country, like less than zero. I mean, people have no ability to discern. They can't even tell like an opinion article from a reported article and a photoshopped photo from a non photoshopped photo. So I think with the rise of AI, it's just going to get much more challenging and the information ecosystem is going to be a lot more confusing, um, which is, I don't know the solution for that right away. You're not honestly. making me feel any better here, Taylor. <laughs> but it's going to be like, fine. Oh God, uh, this is gonna, like... <laughs> I think it's going to be really amazing too. I mean, I think like there's all these, like you mentioned, just the like ability to generate kind of a quick thumbnail or whatever. Like there is a lot more expression when you lower the barrier to creativity, you get a lot more expression. And I think there's going to be a lot of amazing creative content creators that are going to come up that maybe previously would have been locked out of the industry because they didn't have those technical skills or they didn't have the time, right, to like dedicate towards certain things. And so I think it's going to, yeah, I think there's going to be, that's going to be really cool. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I think there is this sort of, like also two major driving factors that are going to be or three driving factors that are going to be played right like you've got the just sort of creation of something but then like how does it make other people feel as the other side of that equation and you know does ai created stuff make people feel like hollow and empty does it you know make them feel angry does it actually make them care about something like i think like those dimensions are going to start to become more and more important and then I think what do people do with it becomes the other component because like what action does somebody who watched that video, are they going to make angry comments? Are they going to make angry videos of their own? Are they going to re retaliate? I don't know that th those are the things I start to wonder, like what will, yeah, this decade look like, because I don't think we've had that defining moment yet other than, you know, we started with a bang at the pandemic, but now what does that, where does that leave us like by 2030? I, I think it's still anybody's guess. Oh, yeah. It's going to be really interesting to see. 
I think none of us are getting less online necessarily though. Like, I mean, right now we have our phones, but you mentioned some other things. It's sort of like this internet enabled world that we live in is inescapable. And I think more things, you know, like just with the rise of like things like wearables, like Apple Watch, I know there's tons of companies working on different glasses. Like I do think that we are gonna live in sort of a augmented reality world that's very intertwined with the internet. Do you think that's making people happier though? Uh, no, not necessarily. <laughs> I think we're in this weird time. I, I talk about this a little bit in my book, but like we're in this weird time where like so much of our online experience is defined by these tools that Silicon Valley kind of creates um, to exploit us <laughs> for revenue. And I would love to see an internet where people had more control over their online experiences and um, you know they were using products and technologies that weren't just so profit driven, you know. Um, there's not a lot of like tech nonprofit platforms, I guess you could say. And I, I just wish there were more kind of like places, digital spaces that weren't, that didn't have these like warped incentive structures for profit. Um, because I do think it like messes with people a little bit and makes us more depressed. But now as we think about all of that and I think about being authentic, one thing that I noticed in the book was sort of there, there, there seems to be this shift that happened where, like the internet used to be really kind of weird and eclectic and it yeah. feels less so. And it feels more, I don't know, kind of part of the technocracy or like what, whatever you want to label it. Like, like what happened yeah. to that kind of quirkiness? Ugh, I know I miss, I think that's like what I'm talking about in terms of like nonprofit driven, like internet spaces, because for the first real decade of the social internet, like especially even into like the early 2010s, there just, there wasn't a lot of money in this industry. The internet was still considered secondary to traditional media, traditional Hollywood. Um, and so people weren't like, there just wasn't the, the advertising market, you know, like hadn't grown to what it is today, like on, just in terms of online advertising. And so I think there was just this ex excitement and positivity and um, sort of weirdness to it um, that as soon as people started to really make money online and really in the mid 2010s, like marketing dollars started pouring into the internet. People realized the value of online advertising. Google and Facebook got way, way, way better at like hyper targeting people. Um, it just, you know, it got, it got so corporate, corporified. I don't know if that's a word, but like corporate, corp corporations took over, <laughs> profit took over. And it's such a bummer. I really, I really, it's cause I think that's sort of what killed a lot of the fun of the internet. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely like <laughs> what the dead Kennedys would always talk about, the scene changing in a yeah. punk rock scene. Like, it's the same kind of principle. I, I think that, that that's a really good point. Yeah, anytime you got a lot of money coming in, it usually kind of, like, kills the fun, uh, weirdly. It's like, oh, we got to we gotta all make money now and monetize. And, I mean, in some ways, that's been really great. Like, you know, people, content creators now have a ton of revenue opportunities that were just not available to early content, you know, earlier people. But... Um, but I think, I think we just need to be very hyper aware of that and kind of find more sustainable revenue streams. I don't think advertising is a great system. Yeah. I, and I think, you know, coming back to my existential crisis that I've been struggling with this week, I don't know, I almost take some, some advice in what you're saying there and that like, if I won the lottery tomorrow, I think I would actually be doing a lot of this very same things that I'm doing today where I would still want to be working on my farm. I'd still want to be on this very farm. I'd still actually want to be making videos because there's a creative expression. And so I think it's probably how do I jettison the elements of it that I don't want and just say to the heck of like looking at view counts and other things like that. And if I'm going to do a weird, like in-depth interview talking about the history of the internet, <laughs> like so be it, who cares if it's out of the niche? Because I think, there is that magic that happens when you're just having fun and exploring and, and, and being yourself. Yeah. And you need those moments to keep you going. Like if you only create content, like sort of for monetization and audience growth and stuff, it's just like this, like dark sort of experience, you know? And so you gotta have, you gotta have your moments of fun. I thought of that recently on TikTok. I posted this TikTok that flopped so hard and I was like, you know what? I like it though. It was, a, it was about a hike with friends and I was like, I don't, it's, it was totally outside. You know, people are like, where's the tech news? What's Elon doing? I'm like, Here, I just wanted to post this video. So, you know, 
Well, but I, but I, I, I think that's exactly it. And that's, that's so much of like, for me personally, something I struggle with where it's like, yeah, if I want to just do something where I'm geeking out about like internet history culture, because that's something I'm always fascinated to learn about, even though it's got nothing to do with raising ducks and geese, <laughs> like go into it because, you know, it's just, it's, it's almost fulfilling to share that with people to say, Hey, here's something I find cool. Don't you guys agree too? Um, but then it just disappoints the folks who are usually like regularly depending on your content for a very specific thing. Totally. And I think that's, what's so hard too, about the internet is like, it kind of does pressure us to put ourselves in these boxes and kind of like define like, what's my brand. Okay. Like stay inside my niche. You know, it's very hard to kind of branch out. That's why you see people making multiple accounts. Like, well, here's my account for this side of me. Right. And here's this account for, to express this side of me. So I hope that like, as we enter this new decade of social media, we can have a little bit more flexibility and like platforms can reward people that are a little bit more like multifaceted too. A hundred percent agree. And I really hope that's the case. <laughs> Hello, no one is available to take your call. Please leave a message after the tone. <clears throat> yeah, uh, this isn't about a tip, but I think there's another crime that's been committed on the farm. Um, fellow by the name of Mr. Toby Dog is uh, extremely cute, and I'm just wanting to know, does he have a license to be that cute? I bet you exhausted your mother when you were young. Have a good day, hon. Oh, I just want to wish Pablo the Barn Cat a happy Thursday afternoon. Thank you very much. So I've got some exciting news. There's a brand new Goldshaw Farm hotline. If you have a question, comment, or tip you'd like to leave for me for a future podcast or video episode, be sure to give it a ring. The number is 802-400-3766. That's 802-400-3766. Oh, Lord, help me. I couldn't believe it was a real phone number. Enjoy the show, bud. Hey, Morgan, I would love if you would leave your graphics up longer. So I guess I want to return back to the question I began this podcast episode with. What kind of farmer is flying away from his farm to go do meetings with potential sponsors? And does living my life extremely online make me any less authentic and real? And after thinking about it a lot and talking with friends as well as folks like Taylor... I feel like I've come to a pretty good, reasonable conclusion. I don't really care. You know, so often in my life, I have been so focused on attaching a label to who I am and to what I do. But as of late, I'm caring about that less and less. And I'm finding that by letting go of that concern about what others think is quite liberating. And so quite frankly, I'm having the best gosh darn summer I've ever had working here on the farm. And I've got to admit, I'm rather satisfied. And so because of that, I'm going to continue to go in that direction. Which actually might also address a question that you, the listener, might be having right now around why did I just dedicate an entire episode of a podcast to the history of social media and why am I talking about something like this when my content's supposed to be about a farm? And well, to be quite honest with you guys, and I haven't talked about this yet, the reason I've restarted this podcast is I want to make it a space for me to kind of do whatever the heck I want. You know, the YouTube videos are going to continue to focus on the farm, and I absolutely love making those videos. But for some time now, I've also wanted to have a way to explore and dig into issues and concepts and ideas and have conversations and tell stories that have absolutely nothing to do with my farm. And so that is why I have restarted the Goldshaw Farm podcast I'm putting it out both as an audio version and a video version, so you can still watch it on YouTube if you'd like, but I'm not going to like push it out to people's subscription feeds just because I know that it annoys certain people, and my hunch is that the people who are interested in this type of content are going to find it anyway, with all praise going to the algorithm gods. I might still end up doing interviews and conversations about farming and life on the farm and stuff that's happening on the farm every once in a while within the podcast space. But also be prepared for the podcast to be, I don't know, much further out there. And so be sure to subscribe either here on YouTube, but then also if you go to anywhere where you listen to podcasts, whether it be Spotify or the Apple podcast thing or Stitcher. I don't even know if Stitcher is still a thing anymore. But anywhere where you might get your podcast, you can find the Goldshaw Farm podcast, and I'll be putting these out every week. I think I'm starting to settle on having these podcast episodes come out every Friday, but I don't know. Stay tuned. That might change a little bit. And I'm going to just keep doing episodes for as long as I like and on topics that I'm interested in, 
And this is just going to be my space to have fun and mess around and create. And I don't know. I hope you guys enjoy it and are along for the ride. If you want to check out Taylor Lorenz's new book, Extremely Online, and believe me, I think it's a wonderful book and you should definitely check it out. I will leave a link for it in the show description or in the video description, wherever you're watching or consuming this. Also, big news, the Toby Dog book, Toby Dog of Goldshaw Farm, a new novel written about Toby Dog's arrival here at Goldshaw Farm, is going to be coming out on September 18th. So we are like counting down the days. You can pre-order the Kindle version. You can pre-order the Audible audio audiobook version. The audio version, I got to say, is probably going to be the coolest thing to come out of this book project. It's narrated by me, but I got like a whole bunch of talented actors to do the voices for all the characters in the book. And so it's like listening to like a little mini audio play or almost like a movie. And so I think you should definitely check it out or you can get the print versions. There's going to be a special paperback version as well as a hardcover version. And so, yes, it would really mean the world to me if you checked out that new book. And for a few special buyers that I will be selecting at random i'm going to be sending out this toby dog action figure it's going to be really cool and i think it's going to be one of those collector items that people are going to be looking for years from now so yes the goldshaw farm podcast is back i hope you guys enjoyed this episode send me emails with feedback write reviews send me you know hate mail whatever i'm totally here for it and i'll be back next week with another episode it's got a soul this hero farm Okay, Lydia Brushing. Deep inside my arms, we walk the fields under yeah. the stars. For love is here, Gold Shop Farms. Some of that brushing ASMR.